I had a dead wife. $350,000 that doesn't belong to me. I had to get out. It's as simple as that. Simple as that. Goddamn simple. Cops have me legally dead. Augustine's got his money. He's not looking for me anymore. I got a girl that loves me. I got more money than Sylvia and Augustine put together. The hell, nobody cares. Yeah, nobody cares but me. Well, that's you, Marlo. You'll never learn. You're a born loser. Yeah, I even lost my cat. Welcome to the Magic Lantern Podcast, an ongoing informal discussion of the films we love and the things we love about them. I am Erica Long. And I am Cole Rowling. Each episode of the Magic Lantern will be devoted to one film that we alternately select and we will discuss why it is significant to us. We've arrived at episode 17. Cole, what is your choice? My choice is The Long Goodbye from 1973, directed by Robert Altman, starring Elliot Gould, Sterling Hayden, Nina Van Pallant, Jim Bouton, Mark Rydell, and Henry Gibson. It was written by Lee Brackett, who also wrote the screenplay for The Big Sleep, the other major significant Marlowe adaptation, and cinematography by Vilmos Zygmunt, who also shot McCabe and Mrs. Miller with Altman, in addition to Close Encounters of the Third Kind, The Deer Hunter, and Heaven's Gate, and music, notably by John Williams and Johnny Mercer. The Long Goodbye is Robert Altman's adaptation of Raymond Chandler's novel of the same name, which is another in Chandler's Chronicles of Knight-Errant Detective Philip Marlowe in 1940s and 50s Los Angeles, here updated to 1973 Los Angeles. It opens in a manner I really love with an extremely sarcastic blast of Hooray for Hollywood, which, if you know anything about Robert Altman, was definitely tongue-in-cheek. And we are introduced to Marlowe, who is asleep, which is actually, it turns out, very important to the idea that Altman and Gould had for the film, which is that the character was more of a Rip Van Marlowe, that he had been asleep since 1953, and he awakens in 1973 to find himself a man slightly out of step with the times. So Marlowe is sleeping, and he is awoken by his cat jumping on him. I like how he went from the last episode to the angel Damiel wanting Philip Marlowe's cat, and now we're with Philip Marlowe's cat. And I love the fact that the opening defining quest of our knight errant detective is his quest to acquire the only food that his cat will eat. And also don't forget to get the brownie mixes for his nightly and nudely neighbors. That gets tacked on. It's okay with me. <laughs> Do you feel as well that the Altman way of creating this film is established immediately? Maybe. It depends. Define for the folks what you think that is. I think it's the perfect distillation of Robert Altman as a director in this film, which is the constantly moving camera, it's the dissonant sound, it's the dissonant voices, it's the pulled focus from one person to another to a different spot in any given scene, and it's the quality of making you focus and taking in a lot more detail than you might if we were just talking about straight close-up to medium shot to long shot. In that case, then, yes, I do believe it does that. It does that by, like you said, having a camera that's never static. It never sits still. I also really enjoy the sound design that you mentioned because, much like with Robert Altman, you get a lot of the overlapping dialogue. No, 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 no. <laughs> no, no, no. You don't understand. I am obsessed with the sound design in this movie. Okay. How come? It's perfect. It's so perfect. I'm trying to come up with the words because I'm supposed to be speaking right now. And instead, I'm telepathically sending you message directly into your lobes so you'll get how much I enjoy the sound on this. I think I've gotten so used to, especially lately, I'm going to say in the last six months or so, that we have watched so many films that key off of silence. Mm. 
And it's almost disorienting to be back in a world that is constantly moving, as we mentioned, and where your ear picks up everything that's happening and the world is constantly moving, even if you are not, even if Rip Van Marlowe is a step out of time, everything else is moving around him. And to be sunk into that world is pretty special. And there are other Altman examples that I might point to later that start to feel like diminishing returns on the sound front to me. This is perfect though. This never gets in its own way, I think is the biggest thing I like about it. Well, the first 10 minutes sets all of that up beautifully, I think, the way you mentioned. It starts with Gould setting the tone for a different type of Philip Marlowe than we've ever seen with his constant just having woken up mumbling to himself, which takes the place of what you would have found in old film noir, which would have been hard-boiled voiceover. You now instead have this soft-boiled running commentary (laughs) that he offers up on his own. His own little soundtrack in his head at all times. It's also brilliantly intercut his trip to the grocery store with his friend, whom we will soon meet, Terry Lennox, on his way to Marlowe's to establish an alibi and get a ride out of the States to Tijuana. And while all of that is going on, the musical theme for the movie that Johnny Mercer and John Williams wrote, the title song for the film. You mean this one? It's a long goodbye. That one? That's exactly the one. By the time Marlowe gets to the grocery store, we've already heard four different iterations of that on car radios, over the Muzak system in the supermarket. And my favorite one, the one that Jack Sheldon sings, the voice of, that most people know as Conjunction Junction and... That's what... Oh, okay, thank you. Didn't you didn't know that's No, I, I know that voice. I grew up with that voice, and you, you made the connection just now for me. I couldn't put it together. Well, he's a prominent jazz musician for decades before that, but the way most people of our generation know him... He's just a bill and he wants to be a law or a conjunction junction. So awesome. And I love the use of that song that we're going to hear in even more permutations throughout the film. And actually, you mentioned that the film opens with Hooray for Hollywood. Those are the only two pieces of music used in the film. Hooray for Hollywood bookends it. It does. And then the long goodbye and its various iteration goes throughout the rest of the film. I think my favorite use of it is the doorbell. The doorbell's pretty good. I like the Mexican funeral band, too. When they've got the sheet music pinned to the back of the person in front Mm -hmm. of them. Yeah. We're 10 minutes in or so, and he's gone to retrieve the cat food, and you've met his new agey neighbors with their nude yoga and pot brownies and candle dipping business. He gets back to his apartment to find his friend, Terry Terry Lennox, Lennox, there waiting for him. And they play a quick round of liar's poker, And Lennox asked for a ride out of the country. The friendship between Terry and Philip is pretty clearly established. You get that they have this friendship that goes back a long time. It may stretch back, but it doesn't feel very deep. Really? I I get that Marlowe really cares for him. That could be the influence, though, of reading the book. Okay. We can talk about that when that comes up. Could be, because I think what Bowden puts across is what eventually is revealed. I feel like the whole time, Bowden is obviously using him, and Marlowe cares for him considerably more than he cares for Marlowe. I agree with you. And so, yeah, I'm with you. I think I'm talking about what I'm reading from Marlowe versus what I'm reading from Terry. Okay. But they definitely know each other. Sure. Which means Terry knows how to play Philip. And he knows that Marlowe is going to be honorable and duty bound all the way down the line. Is it odd that I just called him Philip? Why would I don't know why I Are chose that. Are you on a first that. name basis with <laughs> Guess him? Guess so. It seems so odd to call him anything other than Marlo. It's bizarre. Yeah. You can you can scratch that. No, it's okay. It's you're on a first name basis. You're very so. comfortable and acquainted I, with this character. I feel close to Elliot Gould. I definitely do. He's probably hands down my favorite single actor from the 1970s or who was most prominent in the 1970s. Now, Jim Bouton, on the other hand, I think he makes a great Terry in this. Not an actor, either, technically. Was a professional baseball player, pitched for the Yankees, won a couple of World Series games, pretty great athlete, 
wrote a really interesting tell-all book called Ball Four, which got him blackballed from baseball society. Really? What period of time was that in? Uh, late 60s is okay. what it chronicles. It chronicles 1969 primarily, I guess, and his um, relationship with Mickey Mantle. Mantle was a big hero of his, but it came off... Different generation, too, I would say. Yeah, it came off that he was spilling a lot of secrets about oh. drug use and alcohol abuse on the road and just general hijinks that baseball players get up to that prior to that point were not common knowledge. It was This was before tell-all biographies were a common thing. Like my favorite baseball been Betty Betty Good to me. That one. <laughs> <laughs> Another 70s reference. But yeah, he wrote that book, got him blackballed by baseball insiders. And so he sort of was out in the wilderness for a while before eventually reconciling with those folks and baseball accepting him back into the fold. Now that when you look at what he tells in that book, those stories are relatively tame compared to the things that have gone on since. He was also one of the co-creators of Big League Chew. So I if you ever had that, that as a kid. Was that the one that was sort of the shredded gum? Yeah, it was shredded to look like tobacco. Gross. <laughs> and I had it many times. It came in the pouch. Well, yeah. Right. Okay, the whole tobacco thing. I got it now. Yeah, that's Jim Bowden in a nutshell. He carries that good-looking kind of a little seedy, worn down. Yeah. Pretty boys probably gotten by on his looks for a very long time. Yeah. I could see the character, in fact, Terry, as being a broken-down ex-athlete who is now coasting on that fame still. So Marlo takes Terry to Tijuana and returns home only to be accosted by two detectives who are looking for him because they know of his association with Lennox. And all Terry has said was, the wife and I had an argument, I've got to get out. Something along those lines. And Marlowe just takes him at his word and takes him down to Tijuana. Doesn't ask a lot of questions. Sure, I get the impression that there's been a night or two that he's spent on his couch before. No big deal. The Tijuana wrinkle is a new thing, it feels like. And then the cop showing up is definitely a new wrinkle. When he is being sort of pseudo-interrogated by the cops in his apartment, we see again that example of, this is a different Marlowe. He even says, is this the point where I'm supposed to say, what's this all about? And it, there's definitely a different feel to the entire conversation. And if anything, it feels like these are the cops that might pull out the rubber hoses and the phone books from the 50s as opposed to the 1973 cops. It's also the first point, I realize now, at which... The audience, if you don't carry any foreknowledge of who Philip Marlowe is, first discover that he's a private eye. It's the first time it's, it's mentioned. True. If you don't know the character, you might be wondering this entire time, what's interesting about this guy? Why are we following his story? The arrival of the police is the first time we're given any indication that he's actually a private detective. Or that there are really possibly any stakes, maybe, in his life. Mm -hmm. You know, it's been pretty low-key so far. So they arrest him and take him to the station to be interrogated. And that's when Marlowe discovers that Sylvia, Terry Lennox's wife, has been beaten to death. And Lennox is obviously the prime suspect. So he has now aided and abetted and taken him over international lines, committed a number of felonies, possibly, for what he just thought was kind of a midnight run to save his friend a little trouble during a rocky period in his in his marriage. Marlo looks at these photos and it's a pretty gruesome murder where that's the implication. Yeah, you he, can tell he's really shocked. He insists the whole time there's no way Terry did this. What did you think at that point? I wasn't sure. Because the way they portray Marlo throughout, he's much more naive than previous Philip Marlowe's. He doesn't have that hard-bitten, rough-and-tumble edge. He's much more laconic and a man of reaction rather than action. So I wasn't sure. I felt like it could go either way. I didn't have a definitive feeling about it the first time I watched it. I didn't know. Did you also carry in any of the baggage from having watched the films of that period, of the 40s and 50s, where the police matter makes such a difference in the plot? So we're on this different path. We're on this more laconic path where the stakes are particularly low up until this point where Marlowe's catchphrase is, it's okay with me. 
he is reacting like you said. Did you bring in any of that baggage where you were thinking that a murder mystery was going to be central to this plot and that he has seen all of these things before or that this is something more new to him and shocking? I did bring that baggage with me, but I was disabused of that notion right away by the opening 10 minutes, by that opening sequence of the cat food odyssey and then Terry showing up. Immediately, the film lets you know that this is not going to function like those. So I got rid of that idea right away, pretty much. I guess I asked because I think I come into it, first off, having watched all of the predecessors for it before I actually saw this, which was, at this point, a few years ago, the first time I saw it. What's your favorite prior to this one? I think The Big Sleep, also written by Lee Brackett, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. I had this idea of the hero, and this, of course, is the great period of the anti-hero, and it took a little bit of an adjustment for me. Where in the movie did that turn for you, do you feel like? I think, like you, it happened early in the film, but it was a slower process, so I had to keep recalibrating and recalibrating, and certain things will happen, as we will mention, certain shocking things at different parts of the film that, again... I am rolling with and realizing each time I'm in a completely different world than the world that I kind of grew up in, those films that I grew up watching. Mm -hmm. So they have him in jail for three days as a potential accessory to murder, and he's released to be not exactly picked up by. The the guy, it wasn't arranged, but he has a friend there in the police station who conveniently fills him in on what he's missed while he's been in jail. He's been given no answers during this period. He doesn't know what's happening. And this friend of his, this colleague, gets him set on this new path where we meet the Wades. And Eileen called for Marlowe because she saw his photo in the paper, she says, and he seemed like a stand-up guy. He seemed like the type of man who could do the job that she needed and be discreet and thorough and all the things you would want from a private detective. And if you think about it for two seconds and you look at the picture, you realize he's a disheveled (laughs) mess and he didn't rat on his friend. So what does that tell us about what she is looking for? I question her motivation throughout this thing the absolute most. Definitely. Even though she's, she's the most angelic looking, she's beautiful and blonde and looks like she doesn't sweat and has a beautiful accent, and lives in a beautiful place in Malibu Colony. Right. She's the physical embodiment of the Malibu Beach Colony, where all of this action gravitates around. She's the update to Veronica Lake without any of the hard-bitten depth or mental illness. (laughs) (laughs) And she is Nina Van Pallant, by the way, who I also knew from, I think I saw her actually in American Gigolo, maybe, Mm -hmm. before that. Probably. Most notable for being Clifford Irving, his mistress, in that period of late 70s California jet set pseudo-royalty that they were. That was where a lot of people knew her from. And if you were to sketch out an idea of that California royalty, it would be her, even though she's not Californian. Mm -hmm. She's perfect. Morgan, his friend who takes him home from jail also catches him up on why he was released in the first place, which is that Lennox has committed suicide in Mexico, and there's no more case, essentially. Both the Lennoxes are dead, and Marlowe is left to wonder still how and why did all of this happen, and is struggling visibly on his face, you can tell, to pull all of these threads together because something is not making sense about any of this. He still doesn't believe, number one, that Terry did it and then starts to question whether or not he's actually committed suicide. I think he thinks first, quite possibly, he was murdered in Mm -hmm. Mexico. That's the first thought that comes to his mind, that someone else has done this and there's something larger possibly happening. So Morgan drops Marlowe at the bar, where Marlowe routinely, obviously, picks up his messages, and he has a message from Mrs. Eileen Wade, who wants to engage him for a case. Marlowe goes to meet her at her residence in the Malibu Colony, which is, coincidentally enough, where we saw Terry leaving the night before when he went to go see Marlowe to get Marlowe's help. And him going to meet her is where we get the doorbell theme. Yes, my favorite use. Besides the bar, 
where the piano player is also working on it too. So it's, it's pretty interesting all the ways they managed to work in the song. And this is where we meet the luminous Nina Van Pallant, where Marlo meets Eileen Wade, and she begins to tell him the story of how she wants his help to deal with her husband, Roger Wade, who is this famous author. She says that he has a drinking problem, a long history of alcoholism, and Eileen gives Marlo the mission, find my husband. And did you think of Roger Wade as sort of a Hemingway-esque character? The hard drinking, the gruff manner. I didn't necessarily think of him as a Hemingway-esque character. When you describe it that way, it's almost a caricature that any author of that generation could belong True. to. No, since it's Sterling Hayden, and he, at least for me, is such a specific personality, I didn't conflate the two at all. To me, it was just Sterling Hayden. Or Chandler himself. No, Chandler is so slight and mousy, and this guy is the exact opposite. Roger Wade would not have spent a lot of time with a guy like Chandler, I don't think. Mm, I take that back. He might have amused him enough to keep him around, but they wouldn't have been fast friends, I don't think. What do you think of Sterling Hayden, by the way, who we will meet in a few moments? But before all of that, is he one of your favorites? Oh, I think, what do they say? Duh. <laughs> and or hola. <laughs> yeah, Sterling Hayden is a... Touche, sir. Is a huge favorite of mine. Not coincidentally, he does remind me of you. What about him? Mountain of a guy. Cool beard. <laughs> Silver it, fox. In this, at least, he has a cool beard. I can tell you exactly what he makes me think of. Rather What's than that? Hemingway or myself or anything else. When I look at Sterling Hayden, in this especially, he reminds me of that painting, Wanderer Above the Sea of Fog by Caspar David Friedrich. Oh, that famous painting. <laughs> that one. You know exactly what I mean when I when you see it. It's okay. a guy up top craggy mountains with his cane looking off into what feels to me like the turbulent distance. The fog in this case doesn't feel soothing to me. The fog connotes turmoil rather than comfort or quietness. And that's what he makes me feel like. And Wanderer is the name of Sterling Hayden's autobiography. Interesting. Yes. Marlo now has his mission. To find Roger Wade. So where does he go? So there are some notable things when Eileen and Marlo are having this discussion about her missing husband. He's been gone a week. There's an immense bruise on her face, clearly administered by him so he can be violent. Since we haven't actually met the character yet, it's building this image of him in your head, all these things that he's capable of. The one clue that Marlowe has as to where he might be at all is in his manuscript that he left behind. There is a mention of a Dr. V. But we don't know who Dr. V is no, at this point. No, we haven't point. seen any doctors at all so far. And he also, coincidentally, asks about the Lennoxes, who are beachfront neighbors of theirs, which turns out to be significant. So he takes the case and goes out to try to track down Roger Wade and bring him home. He locates Roger Wade at this sanitarium. Rehab clinic. Yes. Well, I don't know. It's kind of a wide range of clientele, though, mm. it seems like to me. No? You think everybody's alcohol or drug-related, some sort of... The ones who are racking up these sorts of bills? It seems like you're right. There are two types of customers at this place. There are those that cannot actually take care of themselves, which I think are the minority, and being placed where it is, and the type of person that Dr. Berenger turns out to be, I think it is much more for people of note to come quietly dry out, is the feeling I get. He is in that sort of private bungalow, it looks like. Mm -hmm. he, Roger Wade's arguing with Dr. Berenger when Marlowe eventually finds him. Over money. Over money. Dr. Verringer is played by the wonderful Henry Gibson, who was soon to be, after this, a bit of an Altman alum. Yes, he was in Nashville and A Perfect Couple, but maybe more importantly than any of that, he was on Laugh-In, which gives him a lifetime pass in my book. For any other sins he might have committed, like Fish Police, 
Uh, he was also in the Burbs, which gives him pass for life, as far as I'm concerned. It doesn't go into the sin column, in case you were wondering. Uh, okay, you, uh, you're welcome to have that opinion. I think it's interesting that Henry Gibson is such a small person compared to Sterling Hayden, who was over six feet tall. And yet, clearly Roger Wade is intimidated by him. Even in his thrall, would you say? I would, yes. He seems, he's so angry about the prospect too, mm -hmm. which I can imagine a person like that feeling, not and, wanting to be in anyone's thrall. But specifically to this diminutive gentleman, a feeling of impotence even, maybe, more so than thrall, which is what exacerbates the anger. Marlowe delivers Wade home, safe and sound, and he's done his job. So now there's not much left to do except... Maybe check in the next day, see if everything has worked out all right, and case closed, he's on his way. Why do you think he even decides to do that step? He likes him? He feels some sort of sympathy, empathy for him? He's interested? Some of that. I think it's also just a matter of making sure the job is done completely, which again is exactly Marlowe's character. It is. So as they're saying their goodbyes, Eileen brings up Lennox again at this point, just to... Keep underlining for the audience, this is all connected. Don't forget about this thread. Because it will be easy to lose track in the convoluted nature of the mystery plot, much like the big sleep, super convoluted. It's easy to lose those threads, and so Altman is just gently reminding us, keep this in mind, this is still relevant. Marlowe returns home to be accosted by Marty Augustine, sociopathic bookie and gangster, and his squad of goons. And yet another of these threads that we're not sure where is this going to go, but all connected directly to Terry Lennox. Mm -hmm. Marlowe is his usual wisecracking self. Is that a smart remark? No one's trying, trying to be a smart guy? No one's trying to be smart. <laughs> they take him up to his apartment. They toss his place because, as it turns out, Augustine is looking for his money. $355,000 of his money that Terry Lennox has or had that he thinks marlo now has at least some of because why else would you take someone to tijuana at four in the morning well sadly i could think of a couple of other reasons <laughs> but maybe they weren't going to get into them in this movie a word about mark rydell here and his performance which is fantastic as all of these small parts are in this film but mark rydell especially is you can't take your eyes off of him you don't want to look away. He is bombastic and ridiculous. And also another diminutive character who is incredibly aggressive. There's a lot of Napoleonic complex in this. There is. And he wears that Speedo later on, too. <laughs> but he's definitely unpredictable, for sure. And we then see exactly how unpredictable he is. Marty Augustine's girlfriend, that character's girlfriend, was left in the car while they went to go tend to their business with Marlowe. She gets scared down there being by herself, asks if she can come in, and she sits down, and Augustine asks if Marlowe has a coat for her. How stupid do you have to be to be the mistress of a goon, who is obviously a goon, and think... Oh, let me just waltz up to this apartment where uh, my boyfriend and his fellow goons are chatting with this guy. What does she think is happening up there? She obviously didn't think it through. Collecting his neighborhood watch dues. Marlo sends the goon into the kitchen to the refrigerator, which he calls the ice, ice box. box. Have you ever said ice box, by the way? Oh, all the time. You as did? A kid. Okay, yeah, so a it was ton. still a word that you would use. I don't remember saying ice box. Yeah, we did that all the time. So it's just one more of those instances to demonstrate he's a man out of time. Another example, when he brought the brownie mix back to the neighbor girls, they were offering him brownies, and he turned them down and said, but he'd take a Yankee Doodle if they had one of those. I never had one of those myself. They are a wonder of the modern age. Hmm. Individually packaged confection that in 1953 <laughs> would have blown your mind. Yes. So the goon comes back with the Coke that still has a little bit of Coke in it. It's a glass bottle. And Marty uh, drinks the rest of it, doesn't he? And mentions that it's flat. Yes. Because there's only a swallow left yes. in the thing. Because Marlo's the type of guy to just drink 
<laughs> seven eighths of a Coke and put it back in the ice box. You're going to want that later. And here occurs the most shocking bit of violence in the film. Or really in many films. This would stand apart, I think, in a number of films. Mm. It's so violent. And especially here, because before this point, we didn't see the photos of Sylvia Lennox's death. We only saw his reaction to them. We did. And so we haven't seen those realistic consequences of violence. And we are about to have our minds blown and our jaws shattered. Yes, when Marty Augustine takes the empty Coke bottle and smashes it across his girlfriend's face to demonstrate to Marlo, this is what I do to someone I love and I don't even like you, so get me my money. And we know that Marlo doesn't have it, doesn't right. know where it is. In that scene, even his gang is aghast at the level of unpredictable violence he is capable of. These guys that work with him constantly and see and do the terrible things that he does. They're the muscle. They look like it. They're huge. That's so, what they're built for. So can you really blame her for coming up to the apartment not knowing what might happen if this thing that he does is shocking even to his muscle? The answer is yes. <laughs> or should I say, duh. I don't think this is the first time he's ever done something like that. Doesn't bat an eye and then they carry her out to go to the hospital she's obviously screaming and writhing in pain they don't take her immediately to the hospital though because they leave marlo follows them they go back to the malibu colony before they take her anywhere to get any sort of medical aid and here is where he sees augustine with eileen wade for the first time so we're back at the malibu colony and all of these threads are coming together a little bit they're at least associated in marlo's mind now lennox the wades and marty augustine and his money are all now somehow interrelated and all of this activity has taken place in a really compressed time it felt like to me it felt like this was just one long night i know it was more than that it was obviously three days in jail for instance but the feeling you get by the time you get to this point where he's gone from tracking down Wade to the run-in with Augustine and now the next morning when he goes back to check on Roger Wade, it feels like this has been just the longest overnight of anyone's life. He goes back the next morning to make sure everything is okay. At the Wade household. At the Wade household. He asks about Augustine at this point but doesn't get any sort of clear answer. It's either... Marty owes him money or he owes Marty money. Mm -hmm. It's not entirely clear. You can tell At least it's not to me. Right. It's not on the level. No one is on the level about this association. The Wades quarrel like they are prone to do, I assume. And then Marlo and Roger retire to the veranda for a drink to sit down and basically size each other up. Does it feel to you that the scene is not special? specifically pivotal in terms of content i can't recall any earth-shattering information that's imparted but as actor to actor it seems like a pivotal thing i would agree there are a couple of things in it that are mildly interesting in terms of plot minor details but again the plot is so inconsequential it feels like especially the roger wade part of the plot that this can be thrown out in terms of what it offers the story and it is much more about Gould and Hayden's interaction. It's all ad-libbed, correct? Mm -hmm. At least that's what they say. And I believe it. It seems like two people who could definitely pull that off as well. But full disclosure on plot, um, your Big Sleeps and your Maltese Falconses, I still don't entirely understand the plot's <laughs> of those is that just me it took me a while to unravel the thin man too <sighs> the big sleep much more than the maltese falcon agreed next time you watch the big sleep go and sketch it out as you go and see yes professor <laughs> that sounds great draw up a flowchart to see will do and you'll find 
how confusing it is. It's legitimately confusing. Don't feel bad. It takes a couple of tries for everyone, I feel like, to catch the big sleep. Because, one, it's it's got such great momentum that you're kind of swept along with the story and maybe you're not paying such close attention to those things. But it is legitimately confusing and convoluted. You're saying that I am not a dumbo. You are not a big dumbo. Partially. In this case. In this case. (laughs) This one is confusing to... I withdraw the question. (laughs) Okay. Okay. So they have their conversation and then he goes to sleep it off. Mm -hmm. Right? Marlo leaves the Malibu colony... And goes home again. Checking his mail, he discovers there is a goodbye note from Terry in there that has a $5,000 bill in it. Which immediately puts Marlo on a bus to Mexico. Because he wants to find out just exactly what the hell is going on. His friend, who was supposed to be dead, just sent him five grand in the form of an extremely rare bill. An uncommon bill, I should say. So he quite clearly does have Marty Augustine's money. And now Marlo has some of it too. Marlo goes to meet with the Mexican officials that show him Terry's autopsy photos. And they assure him, yes, it is exactly what everyone has said. He killed himself. The man is dead. So Marlo is again adrift, not knowing where this money exactly came from, who's dead, and why, who did what to who. They try to assure him that all channels have been utilized, all I's dotted and T's crossed, everything very modern and above board, but he still doesn't believe it. So Marlowe's curiosity is as satisfied as it's going to get in regards to what's happened to Terry Lennox. So he returns to California, goes back to the Wades where there is a beach party happening, a cookout. And Dr. Berenger shows up, uninvited guests there to get the $5,000 approximately that Roger owes him for his treatment. So right there in front of everyone assembled, demonstrating his control over Wade, Berenger slaps him in the face and demands to be paid. Wade tucks his tail between his legs, sheepishly goes off to write the check, and then... Marlo is the one left to get rid of Berenger, to Mm. intimidate him kick him out because wade is useless at this point he cuts the check and then he drifts off into a stupor party's over party is over (laughs) everyone go home we'll try this again some other day marlo stays for dinner though and what do you think about this scene where eileen has made this gorgeous spread the nicest dinner marlo's ever had and they're alone it's candle lit do you think it's reasonable that if she were to think it necessary, she would essentially try to sleep with him? I do not doubt it for a second. It's clearly a seduction. Why does she not do it? Because they're interrupted. She could have done it earlier, I'm thinking. They were sitting there for a while. It could have happened long before that. Why do you think she decided against it? No, I don't think so. I think it's just the way the thing unfolded. Certain things take a certain amount of time, and unfortunately for her in this case, she's cock-blocked by her husband wandering into the sea and drowning. (laughs) Right. It has happened to me so many times. Marlo is also trying to get to the bottom of this. He's not being cooperative necessarily because he's not exactly receptive to the seduction. He's grilling her about what exactly is going on. All of these disparate threads and details that aren't making sense. He's there more to get answers than anything else. It seems like as well that there have been other instances in the film where, I mean, he lives next to the the nudist apartment. At any time, he could likely take someone up on some sort of offer, but sexuality doesn't seem to really play a part in his character. No, not for Marlo. For everyone else, possibly, but not for Marlo. He's there to do a job. $25 a day plus expenses. Nothing else. Do you think he would wear that same suit during? (laughs) He would carefully fold up his mismatched blue pants and mismatched blue jacket. He does take the tie off to go in and try to save Roger Wade. Which is a crucial point of characterization, as it turns out. That tie has little tiny American flags on it. Which we can't see due to the photography process, this this beautiful thing that 
Zygmunt did, but you can't you can't see that detail. No, you can't. But he knows it. Marlo, this unorthodox patriot that he is, when he rushes into the surf to save someone's life, quickly comes back, takes off the tie, and hands it to her for safekeeping. <laughs> so his tiny flags aren't desecrated. He is not successful as he has not been successful at other things, and Roger Wade is dead. And then we see, in the one scene that seems out of character, where Marlow is somewhat out of control, that laconic, laid-back, it's-okay-with-me thing, that cracks for the first time as they're conducting the investigation on the beat. He's yelling at people. He's telling the neighbors to get away. He's telling the police to stop bothering everybody. He's trying to protect Eileen is what it sounded like, seemed like to me. mm -hmm. He throws a bottle. He says he's going to go after Ronald Reagan. (laughs) He's making wild (laughs) accusations and claims that are unfounded. So after this brush with death, Marlo goes back to Augustine because his time is up. And again, it's just one more incredibly long night, long day. Mm -hmm. Never seems to end. The suit never changes. He shows up at Augustine's place to explain yet again, I don't have the money. I don't know where it is. Although now he has a slightly better idea of what might have happened to it. It's so odd to me to think that he would choose to go to Augustine. He hasn't been summoned. He hasn't been drugged there. Uh, He hasn't been rounded up. So why does he take it upon himself to go? Because it's his obligation. Because he was given a deadline and time is now up. Time to pay the piper. Also, I think some of it's motivated by a slight bit of guilt because his suspicion is now that Terry very definitely took the money because he has that $5,000 bill in his wallet, which shows up in a second. That, again, makes him almost an accomplice in this case. Do you think it's because he also wanted to meet Arnold Schwarzenegger (laughs) in that scene? And see his sweet little wispy mustache? That is a nice mustache. He goes back to Augustine, and Augustine assembles his gang again. And as a way to ensure that everyone is being honest, Augustine, in his inimitable fashion, demands that everyone takes off their clothes. This is after Marlowe has specifically asked how Joanne, the mistress who got beaten up so savagely, asks how she's doing. And she comes back into the room again. So immediately that tension is there, that anything can happen. This could immediately go extremely badly. That feeling that is in the pit of your stomach, wondering and fearing what might happen to her Again, because we know that he doesn't have the money. We know this isn't potentially going to turn out well. So what might happen for Augustine to prove his point? Augustine tells a story about how after he did that to her, he stood in her hospital room naked before her to apologize. Not after he did it to her, after Joanne became ill. Mm, Right. (laughs) And so he's going to have everyone take their clothes off so that everyone can be completely honest and open with each other. And Marlo just gets as far as having his jacket taken off and we see the bill in his wallet. Yeah, he drops his wallet. The $5,000 bill conspicuously pokes out. Augustine picks it up and starts to grill him, obviously thinking, okay, you're just lying. You know where my money is because you quite clearly have some of it in your possession. And we think situation's about to escalate really quickly. And then Marlo is saved by the bell. A fairy godmother drops $355,000 on the porch. Or $350,000 maybe. Yeah, since Marlo has five. five. Which Augustine offers to let him keep as a memento of their adventure (laughs) together. Yes. So... Marlo is out of there, and he spots Eileen Wade driving away in her convertible with the license plate, love you, on it. And he sets out on foot to try to catch up with her. And is nearly as quickly hit by another car and ends up in the hospital. What is that scene telling you? A few things, I think. One, again, he's this born loser. He makes these terrible decisions, like setting off on foot to do this, that... 20 years ago might have worked for a moment, but aren't going to now. And also, he constantly has to be delayed by these other things. He's either put in jail or beaten up or these fruitless trips to Mexico. 
or these people telling him the incorrect information or these long dinners or these even longer nights and days. He's got to be put on the sidelines for this. He's not this proactive man of action. He's not the Humphrey Bogart, invincible tough guy. He's a schlemiel. He is. That's where honesty gets you. <laughs> That's where persistence gets you. In the hospital. In the hospital. He wakes up in the hospital. He decides to check himself out on his own recognizance and heads. Back to Mexico. Because where else is there to go at this point? There isn't anywhere. Eileen is moving. He went back there to find out what he could from her to find the house is empty. There's no more recourse. That nagging suspicion, I think, is still in his gut about what exactly happened in Mexico. So he goes back again, meets with the same guys, and ironically enough, the money that Lennox sent him turns out to be Lennox's undoing because it's that money that he uses to persuade the corrupt officials to cough up the truth this time. Yes, let me slide this 5,000. Oh, we were lying the whole time, and here's the true story. <laughs> and here's where Lennox is. Yes, here's his address. Here's his social security number. And finally, we arrive at Lennox's new villa. The police told Marlo where he is. Marlo goes to confront him. And if we haven't spoiled it enough already, don't listen to the next part unless you've watched the movie. Surprise, Terry Lennox did it. Yes, he, he killed, killed his, his wife. wife. Violently. He and Eileen were in on it together. Would you put it that way? I would. It wasn't premeditated, though. That implies premeditation. I think they had to know what was going to happen. They had to know. They had to know the complexity of what was going on. They can lie to themselves... But like Robert Altman said, you can't lie to life. I think we disagree okay. about this particular one because of a couple of things. I'll tell you what I mean. I don't think it was necessarily premeditated. I think it was convenient, and they are happy that it worked out that way. If the two stories parallel each other, for instance, the Lennox is in the Wades, there's no way that she could have predicted that Wade would wander into the sea, drunkenly drowning himself. But it certainly is convenient, and we're not going to quibble over something that works out in our favor. Maybe. I don't think you can be married to those people and set yourself up in life like that. And in, and in Terry's instance, coast through life like that without having littered your path with the destruction that you've created that doesn't always touch you, and this time it has. I 100% I, I think it was premeditated. I think the timing was convenient. I think it was premeditated, and it so, would have happened sooner or later. Okay, he would have killed Sylvia eventually. So all of these things he was doing, having this affair with Eileen, is that multifaceted? Is that not only to satisfy himself and to have this beautiful thing that he wants, but it's also to goad his wife into some... That's awfully dangerous. That's a big risk to take, with his explanation being that she was going to spill everything about Marty's money and all of those things, you are taking a huge chance that everything is going to fall into place. If you take $355,000 from a gangster, <laughs> you, you have set yourself up for something. And I think it is also very telling that he says, I got this girl who loves me, not I love this girl and mm. I'm doing all of these things for this. It's nope. That's a very good point. At any rate, Marlo finally dispenses the justice that Lennox has dodged all this time. And Marlo simply straight up shoots him. It's an incredibly profound ending. I, it's a legendary ending. I love the ending so much because it leaves me feeling so empty. <laughs> it's one of my favorite things about the movie. We talked about this after we watched it initially the other night about how much this movie hollows me out and how it feels like None of this, none of this existence means a damn thing. I think it's an incredibly fascinating ending, if nothing else from the standpoint of Lee Brackett, the screenwriter. We talked about she wrote the original, The Big Sleep. Mm -hmm. She went from the source decades later to this almost meta version of the source. How fascinating is that to have gone through those changes in Hollywood, in writing? Especially considering what she was doing otherwise. The bulk of what she did otherwise was pulp science fiction. She was huge in that, which eventually led to her also co-writing The Empire Strikes Back. 
probably the most famous piece of pulp science fiction ever made. But in between that, yes, these two pieces of hard-boiled detective fiction. She distilled the age. She makes a change like this that we could have never seen coming in 1953 and makes it perfect in 1973. The thing that's pivotal about that final scene for me is included in our little playlet that opens the show, that line that nobody cares but me. All this time, he's established this, it's okay with me, as his catchphrase, whereas Marlowe in 1946 might have been handy with a gun, this Marlowe's handy with a shrug. But now, finally, at the end, he does what may be, in the film, his first decisive action. Until this point, he's been buffeted by the winds of circumstance this whole time, and is just sort of riding the crest of this wave, managing it as best he can, but he's definitely not a master of his own destiny, it feels like, until this point, where he finally plants his feet and does the thing that absolutely has to be done, according to his code. Because it seems like up to now, telling right from wrong isn't necessarily his strong suit, which is or peculiar. Is, or is asked of him. For a detective, especially. Someone who is supposed to have insight into human nature. He loses at Liar's Poker right off the bat, which sets the tone for his entire interaction with every other human he runs into. He's not reading them very well. He's not catching all the nuances, which would seem to be a detriment to a private eye. But finally, he corrects all of that and does the thing that has to be done. And leaves back on that Mexican road to walk back and is again kind of buffeted by the crowd that is assembled, the people that have come out from the trees and he dances with a woman and is moving back and forth and is again himself, do you think? Yeah, he's reclaimed himself, finally. Justice has been served, an order has been restored somewhat, and that fits with what a guy like him needs for this world to keep on turning. And then it's hooray for Hollywood again, and the credits roll. You mentioned before how empty the ending especially, and then the film as a whole, leaves you every time you watch it. And I know you've watched it many times. So if someone else were to have said that to me, I would say, why do you watch it so much? But for you, I know you, it makes perfect sense. How did that inform why you chose the film for this podcast? Because this one affects me the most, this Marlowe. All the other ones I enjoy, again, The Big Sleep, chief among them like you, I think. They're great movies, and they're really fun crime stories, but none of them affect me the same way. I chose this because this is the Marlowe I love the most, and also the last Marlowe I would hire. <laughs> wait, wait. How do I take that? Does that mean you'd hire him because we're absconding with the 350000 and he's the patsy that we pin it on? Or he's the last person that you would ever hire? More like he's the last person I would ever hire. Because I love him so much, I wouldn't put him in harm's way. I would not use him the way Terry Lennox used him. I because would... he's done so much for me since I discovered this. I'd help him find the cat food. <laughs> I'd save a brownie for him. I'd hang out with him for sure. For a long, long time, McCabe and Mrs. Miller was my favorite. Robert Altman. Second now. When I discovered this a few years ago and began to watch it obsessively, I realized that it's about code, I guess, and I really identify with having a somewhat rigid set of rules by which I... Somewhat. <laughs> set of rules by which I operate. There's, there's gray area. There's room for interpretation. That's why it's so surprising to me that you only discovered this a few years ago. Again, knowing what I know of you, I would have assumed that you saw this as a young person. No. That it essentially kind of helped shape how you see things. And that's not the case. It would have had I seen it, but... Instead, it was more a case that I discovered it later in life and just coincidentally felt like it was made for me. It's perfect in that way, rather than being formative. It's more confirmation bias than formative. <laughs> Would you have chosen it for the show? Definitely. It is my favorite Altman. 
That makes two of us. And I discovered McCabe and Mrs. Miller much, much later, only last year. Mm. So I didn't have that one to compare. I had, I think actually the first Altman I saw was probably The Player, I'm guessing. And I saw that in the theater when it came out when I was that age. And then discovering this film, I think I came to it as we have often come to these pivotal films. I saw it on a list. Mm -hmm. And it was mostly about the ending. And so, as I had mentioned, I came to the predecessors of this movie first. I grew up watching the 40s and 50s of those noir and those hard-boiled detectives. And to come to this was pretty amazing. It doesn't leave me with the same feeling of emptiness. It doesn't speak to me in the way that you do. I'm so in love with the technical prowess of it that mm. seems so perfect as I harped on earlier. I'm obsessed with the sound in this. And there are so many things that check all of my boxes that make this so important to me. And it grows with me as I age as well. I think I came, I, well, I know I came to it before you did. I saw it probably about 10 years ago the first time. So I've, had a little bit longer to live with it and have it speak to who I am as I get older and what changes within me. And how have you evolved, do you feel like, in a way that's relevant to what the movie says over the course of a decade? Well, maybe it's that ebbing away of forgiveness, why I'm so adamant about what I see as Terry and Eileen's motivations okay. and their degree of premeditation or not. I don't appreciate being the person buffeted by circumstance. And I don't appreciate seeing other people violate our common code. And whereas I might have been the it's okay with me earlier, I don't feel like that anymore. People have to speak to the consequences of their actions. That or maybe I've just become a sociopath like <laughs> Marty Augustine. And I'm going to dispense some justice myself. Remind I me. was drinking that Coke. <laughs> Remind me to only put plastic bottles in the refrigerator or the ice box. I mentioned the technical prowess and I think what I also respond to is that feeling of hearkening back to my childhood. I was born in 1975 so shortly after this my parents were in Southern California at that time and I think back to all of my family photos from a young age and they all look like this film. Something about it speaks to something inside of me that feels very familiar. Mm, I think we said this too after after we watched it and we talked about it. I know it's supposed to very specifically evoke that period of Southern California, but to me, you're right. It looks like the 1970s. It doesn't specifically look like California in the 70s. Everywhere looked like that in the 70s. It did to me, at least, in my mind. And I've been to Southern California since then, and it still looks like that. I lived there... It still feels like that. And funny I should bring that up because that leads directly into my recommendation, okay. if I may start. Absolutely. What is that? It is Inherent Vice mm. from 2014, one of our favorites, and I'm sure one of the world's favorites at this point. Directed You'd by... You'd be surprised. Really? That one's a... This one is not as universally beloved as I also thought... Well, there are some dummies in the world. <laughs> anyway, it's directed by Paul Thomas Anderson and features Joaquin Phoenix in a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful performance with Catherine Waterston and Josh Brolin, among many others. And I chose this because it evokes that same feeling of in me that feels so true to the time. It feels and looks like what my imagination says that it does. And so much like this film... It brings out the feeling of the time without wandering into cliché or obvious touchstones. Mm -hmm. Also features a private eye buffeted by change in his own sometimes lack of understanding or uh, skills or capabilities. And I think also features a really fascinating ending that feels quite true to the character and is unexpected. At least it was to me. Also, full disclosure, you did have to explain a couple of things that happened in it <laughs> to me. So you're welcome. Inherent Vice, 2014. Okay. Well, my selection is a bit more of a tangent than yours. I'm going to recommend a film by Mark Rydell. The actor who plays Marty Augustine in this was also a director. 
which we I guess we didn't touch upon that much now that I think about it. But mm. that's what he is known for. Right. He made a ton of things. Cinderella Liberty is probably the biggest one. But the one I like the most is called The Fox, a film from 1967 that stars Sandy Dennis, Anne Haywood, and Keir DeLay. And it's an adaptation of a D.H. Lawrence novella of the same name. It's about two young women who are just out of college or so, mid-twenties, that are managing a farm, and it's as far from Southern California as it gets. This is filmed in the Canadian wintertime, and DeLay shows up and is the proverbial fox in the hen house. The two women, one of them is much more satisfied with this rural existence than the other, so there are already some tensions, some of them romantic, which was a little bit groundbreaking for 1967, and it's a classic case of interloper comes in stirring up hormones and trouble. And it's beautiful to look at. And there are a couple of really interesting experimental almost sequences in it that prefigure some of this Altman-esque overlapping dialogue and, and things like that. So who knows? Maybe a reason that he chose Rydell in the first place because he saw an artistic similarity in the way they communicate certain things. But anyway, The Fox, it looks fantastic. Sandy Dennis is great in it. Sandy Dennis is great in everything, ever. Never gets talked about enough to me. And directed by Mark Rydell, one of the stars of this film. It was also, coincidentally, one of those that had heavy A&E rotation early in A&E's history. I remember it's... The Fox was? Yes. Hmm. I didn't remember it for that. I think I saw it on TCM. Also with... Apples are not the only fruit, or whatever that movie was. That one would get heavy rotation. And Porky's. No? No. Okay. <laughs> Which explains why I have yet to see Porky's. And on that note... That brings us to the end of another episode. I wanted to offer a special thanks again this time to Aaron West and Mark Herney at Criterion Close-Up. They had me on recently to discuss Antichrist and other films that push the envelope and that was a really fun discussion if you'd like to check that out you can find that at criterion close-up did porky's figure into that conversation porky's was not in that conversation who's doing your research people if you would like to get in touch with us about porky's or anything else you can find our email address at magic lantern podcast at gmail.com we are on twitter at lantern underscore cast and i wanted to say thanks again to all the people in the last couple of weeks that have either shared links to the show or reached out to us to tell us the things that they enjoy. Thanks to Tim Lego, Grindhouse Dave, and Jeff Duncanson, as always, Matteo Boscarol, Brian Sauer, Craig Eastman, and the guys at FUDS on Film. If you are not listening to that show, you are really missing out. Charlie Fulton, Anthony Elmore, Todd Rosie, RJ Tugas, Dave B. at DVD Infatuation. Teresa Rucker sent us a really nice compliment about discovering Gregory's Girl through our recommendation, and they had a family movie night and loved it, so I really am glad that they enjoyed that. Lisey Tribble Russell. Leanne Kupich got in touch with us about how much she really loved The Wings of Desire, and she wrote a great piece on Wings of Desire herself over at Penland Empire. Cheryl Jones at Movies Made Me, another fantastic show. And you can find us on iTunes and Stitcher Radio. We would certainly appreciate it if you rate and review us while you're there. If you enjoy the show, we had two really nice reviews this time around. One from Alex Cespedes and one from iTunes user Acme TNT, who knew exactly how to flatter us by referring to us as Nick and Nora. And we really appreciate you guys leaving those. Thanks a lot. It means a ton to us, and it helps get the show in front of more people. And finally, if you would like to check out the website, it's magiclanternpodcast.com, and there you can find all of our episodes, including supplemental show notes. And thank you for listening to the Magic Lantern Podcast. <laughs>